And transcribed in Hollywood with John Scott Trotter and his orchestra, the Rhythm Airs, and Bing's guests. Barry Fitzgerald of Paramount Pictures, Dorothy Kirsten of the Metropolitan Opera, and the Ken Darby Chorus of several fine voices. And now it's time to open our gilded cage and release Philco's songbird, Bing Crosby. Well, thank you, Ken, but you really don't have to get so fancy with your introduction no? here. Who do you think you are, Portland Hoffa? <laughs> huh? No. Let us get off the siding, eh? Get on the main line with the Freedom Train. If the rhythm airs and John Scott Trotter are ready, we shall hop aboard, eh, laddie? Lassie, come along then. This song is a train song. It's a song about a train. Not the Atchison and Topeka. No, not the Chattanooga choo-choo. The one that leaves the midnight. For the state of Alabama, this song is a train song where the engineer is Uncle Sam. Here comes that freedom train. You'd better hurry down. Just like a Paul Revere is coming into your hometown. Inside that freedom train, you'll find a precious freight. Those words of liberty, the documents that made us great. You can shout your anger from the steeple. You can shoot the system full of holes. You can always question we the people. You can get your answer at the polls. That's how it's always been and how it will remain. As long as all of us keep riding on the freedom train. You can write the president a letter You can even tell him to his face If you think that you can do it better Get the votes and you can take his place Here comes that freedom train Chug it, chug, you better hurry down Just like a Paul Revere It's coming into your hometown You can hate the laws that you're obeying you can shout your anger to the crowd We may disagree with what you're saying But we'll fight to let you say it loud That's how it's always been And how it will remain As long as all of us keep riding Riding on the freedom train Riding on the freedom train Bing and Rhythm Airs and Ken Darby oh, Chorus. Thank you, thank you. We all did our very best. Well, Bing, you should. That's the old Philco spirit. Everything's Philco with this fellow tonight. I don't know what's going on. Well, Bing, it's Wednesday night. What do you expect me to talk about? Hook drugs? Yes, Hollywood Loomcraft drugs. <laughs> Palamine runs a place by that. Oh, you'll get, get one for that. I think a little discourse on hook drugs would be very interesting. Well, I agree with you, Bing. There's nothing like a hook drug under a beautiful Philco console. Oh, this boy is filled with grim determination, isn't he? There's nothing I can do but... Yield the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. C. I just want to tell the folks about Philco's super smooth automatic record changer. It's a new type safety changer that won't chip or chew up your records. Doesn't get out of whack if you just breathe on it either. Handles up to 12 records at a clip. Gentle as a baby in a bassinet. The new Philco's are like that. No shortcuts, no shoddy workmanship, but top quality all the way through. So for your best buy in radio phonographs, look at a Philco first. Remember, every radio Philco makes is backed by the resources of the world's largest radio manufacturer. Research laboratories, materials, radio know-how, plus the capacity of the longest radio production lines in the world. It all pays off 
in the most for your radio money. The outstanding values at your dealer today from Philco the Leader, famous for quality the world over. <laughs> fanfare would be John Scott Trotter rolling out our musical carpet for the first guest of the evening. Sounds like he's really got his teeth into the carpet, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce the very lovely and tremendously talented young lady from the Metropolitan Opera Company, Miss Dorothy Kirsten. Hello, Bing. Dorothy, I think the opera people are very fortunate having you in their company. I heard you sing the opera Louise, and you were a smash. I'm glad you liked it, Ving. You know, I've spent most of the summer studying Louise in Paris. Oh, Dorothy, I'm going to Paris to study next summer myself. Are you going to study Louise? Oh, Louise, Yvette, Mimi, <laughs> I paint, you know. I know. I've seen some of your shirts. Yeah, no. <laughs> Well, radio isn't a very dressy business, Dorothy. We're very informal. Oh, I know. I kicked around in radio for a long time before I went into opera. How oh, isn't that funny? You started out in radio and wound up in opera. I started out in opera and I wound up in radio. Opera? Yeah. You, Bing? Yes. When? A long, long time ago. I, I sang several seasons with the Spokane Wenatchee Opera Company. <laughs> I was very big in Rigoletto. <clears throat> yes. You know that part in Rigoletto where the tenor has to hit the high note? Mm-hmm. And you sang it? No, but I helped the guy who did. I stood behind him with a spear. <laughs> you really threw yourself into your part, didn't oh, you? Oh, I was pitching at all times in those days. <laughs> One performance, though, I ever overdid it a little, and the poor guy had to finish his solo from the chandelier. <laughs> Opera certainly must have been lively in Spokane. Oh, we were gay in those days. By the way, Dorothy, what's your favorite opera? Portia Faces Life. <laughs> She's a grand girl, isn't she, Portia. She's a good guy. I never miss it either. Is, is there an aria from the Portia Faces Life that you might like to sing tonight, Dorothy? Well, I could sing the theme song, but I don't see an organ around here, well, so... Well, <laughs> how about Victor Herbert's uh, Romany Life? Love to. From the fortune teller, huh? Uh-huh. I tell you what, while you're singing it, I'll wander out in the audience and read tea leaves or something, huh? <laughs> okay with me, Bing. Dorothy, the stage is yours.
They're really wonderful. Uh, look, uh, if I may make so bold, uh, I'd sure like to join you in another of the immortal Victor's tunes, huh? I'd love to sing a duet with you, Bing. But let me warn you, I'm no Lawrence Melliker. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> and I'm no Jimmy Durante. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll muddle through it somehow. John Scott, mood music. Indian summer, if you have it in the books there. That comes after June time's laughter. You see so many dreams that don't come true. Dreams we fashioned when summer To watch over some heart that is broken by a word that somebody left unspoken. You're the ghost of a romance in you going astray. Too soon, that's why I say farewell to you, Indian summer. You are here to watch over, to watch over some heart that is broken. Some heart is broken by a word that somebody Ooh. left unspoken. Ooh. You're the ghost of a romance in you going astray, fading too soon. That's why I say farewell. Please stand by for the jackpot question. At this juncture, let's roll out the Kelly Green carpet for my delightful sidekick of several happy motion picture adventures, the Dennis Day of the Social Security set, Mr. Barry Fitzgerald.
Thank you, Ingrid Bergman. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> you and your silly introductions, Bing. Well, I was just kidding, Barry. Welcome, stranger, from the picture of the same name. <laughs> Bing, this being around Thanksgiving time and all, I feel a little guilty about something I did. You haven't been taking anti-brogue shots, have you? <laughs> no, Bing, but I did something very underhanded, and it's a personal insult to you. Oh, what is it, Barry? Get it off your chest. Confession is good for the soul. Thank you, Father O'Malley. <laughs> come on, now. Come on, let's have it. What is it? Well, when you were up in Jasper Park, I sneaked out to Universal Studio and made a picture without you. Oh, Barry, how could you? It's called Naked City. <gasps> Yes, I played the part of a police officer. It's a sort of going my way in a patrol wagon. Well, tell me, Barry, in this picture, do you wind up getting the girl? Girl? Ooh, listen to the man. <laughs> I don't think you want to get the girl. Why, you're not even married, Barry. But being married would interfere with me hobby. What is your hobby? Bachelorhood. Barry, you're missing a great life. No, but when it comes to women being, I don't want any of the sweet-smelling selves sashaying around my house. You're really opposed to them, huh? When I walk into the bathroom, I don't want to be slapped in the back of the neck with a pair of wet nylons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now, I'd like you to meet a very lovely lady. I think she might change your opinion. Let me introduce you to Miss Kirsten. She's an opera star. Ah, uh, one of those screechers and screamers. <laughs> I think I'd rather be smacked with Wedding Island. <laughs> this, this girl is not a screecher or a screamer. Oh, Dorothy. Yes, Bing? Uh, Miss Kirsten, I'd like to present Mr. Barry Fitzgerald. How do you do? Good morning, you Bing. If she takes one step nearer to me, I'll make myself invisible. <laughs> Bing, what's he talking about? Oh, he'll do it, too. He's a tricky little leprechaun. Leprechaun? Yes, Barry's the only full-blooded leprechaun in captivity. Oh, come now, Bing. Leprechauns are only in fairy tales. Well, the story of how I first met Barry very nearly is a fairy tale, Dorothy. It all began many years ago on a little side street in Spokane, Washington. Late one summer's night, the dull lamp in a shoemaker's workshop cast eerie shadows over the cluttered benches. Well, Harry, it's getting pretty late, and you've still got a lot of work piled up on your bench there. Gee, I wish a little leprechaun would sneak in here tonight and finish up all of me work. Oh, you Irish lads with your silly notions. You're always calling for banshees to frighten your enemies and leprechauns to do your work. But it's been a long... Never mind, never mind. I'm going home now. And don't you dare leave until you finish Mrs. Rochford's heels and Dr. Lynch's hunting boots. Good night, Harry. Good night, sir. <clears throat> Heels and hunting boots, soles and brogans, tips and lifts. Boy, if I could just get hold of one good old-fashioned Irish leprechaun to do my cobbling for me. I could go to the flickers and sing with the slides. When Irish eyes are smiling, short is like a morning spring. What? Yeah, well, who the blazes are you? Me name is Fitzgerald. And let me add that you're as sorry a shoemaker as I've ever seen. Oh, I suppose you could do better, old-timer. Yeah, I could. And don't call me old-timer, young-timer. It so happens that I'm one of the youngest of all the leprechauns. You, leprechaun? Yes, I'm only 3,867 years old. <laughs> well, you don't look a day over 3,600. <laughs> well, I know all about leprechauns, and I don't think you're one because you're not invisible, and besides, you're too big. <laughs> Look who knows all about leprechauns. Well, if you're a leprechaun, I'm Nelson Eddy. Oh, so it's proof you're wanting your pretty upstart. Yes. Now, I just have to sprinkle some magic powder on you. Mammy, little baby loves to shorten and shorten and a mammy, little baby loves... Well, I'll be darned. No, no, do you believe me? <laughs> well, gee, if you're a leprechaun, you're the biggest one I ever heard of. What are you, the new giant home economy size now? No, me boy, I'm a hexed leprechaun, driven out of Ireland by me fellow pixies, never to return until I can replace that which I've destroyed. And what did you destroy? Only the greatest singing voice in all of Hibernia, John Francis Patrick Mulroney the third. The third? Yes, his mother was married twice before. <laughs> 
Maroney was the only man who ever lived who could sing a certain song good enough to please us all as leprechauns. Well, if he could sing so good, why did you destroy him? Well, oh, I'm a regular practical joker. You know, it's all on account of me that there are so many rabbits in the world. How come? Well, hmm? when Noah was bringing animals on his ark two by two, I slipped in an extra pair of bunnies. <laughs> What happened with Mulrooney the Third? Well, one day we were all picnicking near the Blarney Stone and Mulrooney was about to sing for us. And just for good luck, he leaned way over to kiss the stone first. And? Well, being of a playful nature, I tickled him with the quill of a poofer bill bird. They're extinct now, thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> well, anyway, Mulrooney the Third got to laughing and fell from the rock and broke his neck in three places. <laughs> You must have felt bad for tickling Mulrooney the third, eh? Oh, I felt terrible, 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 terrible. <laughs> How did the leprechauns take it? Oh, they wanted to break my neck. But you can't kill a leprechaun, so they put a hex on me. They turned me into human form and sent me away to wander the world until I found another voice which could sing our song as good as Mulrooney the third. But why must you have a voice like Mulrooney singing just one special song? <laughs> You weak human being, don't you know that leprechauns can't go to sleep without that special soothing song? I tickled Mulrooney almost 1,500 years ago, and we leprechauns haven't slept a wink in all that time. And believe me, boy, we're getting mighty drowsy. Well, um, now, I'm getting mighty drowsy, too, so if you'll excuse me, I'd better finish Mrs. Rochford's Oh, year. no, no, you don't, lad. I heard you humming a good old Irish tune, I've got a hunch that you're just the fellow to replace Mulrooney the third and reinstate me as a leprechaun in good standing. Come on, me boy, we're off to Ireland. But I can't, I've got to fix these no, shoes. No, not at all, me boy. Me magic power will take care of everything. Gee, whiz. Be quiet now, be quiet now, fellow leprechauns. I tell you that after searching for over 1,500 years, I'm positive that this young fellow is the logical successor to Mulrooney the Third. He'd better be good. Yes, I've got to get some sleep. Ah, you'll get your sleep. Now, quiet. All right, honey, my boy, here's the words of the music to the song. Now, get over here by the Blarney Stone and sing it good, or I'll tickle you with this feather. I'll do my best, Fitz. <laughs> Success, me boy. I knew you could do it. Look at them, they're all sleeping like angels. In fact, <laughs> I'm slipping away myself. <laughs> well, Bing, that was the most amazing tale I've ever heard. Well, it is pretty amazing. <laughs> Amazing tale, all right, Dorothy, but it's really nothing. Wait till you hear what the Philco man has to say. This is out. Oh, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bing, you can also soothe leprechauns with Philco's new electronic scratch eliminator, especially the leprechauns who raise hob in your radio phonograph. The ones who hiss, hum, squeak, and snore every time you play records. You won't hear another peep out of the little people with this exclusive new development from the Philco Laboratories. It automatically tunes out needle scratch and surface noise, lets you hear all the music in any phonograph record, old or new. 
Felco engineers found a way to separate the noise from the music and to keep the noise out electronically. From now on, no hiss, no squeak, no scratch. Just a background of blissful silence to the exquisite soft passages. It's the greatest advanced in recorded music since Philco introduced a new kind of tone arm, the patented dynamic reproducer. Together, they're an unbeatable combination in the radio phonograph of connoisseurs, the Philco 1270. Ask your Philco dealer now for a free demonstration of the great Philco 1270. It's the last word in luxurious listening from Philco, the leader. And now that we've uh, put all the leprechauns to sleep, you folks are next. The selection I've chosen is I Wished I Didn't Love You So. This is quite a soporific. I wish I didn't love you so. My love for you should have faded long ago. Smiling by now with some new tender friend. Smiling by now with my heart on the man. But when I try, something in that heart says no. I didn't love you so I would like to mention that the U.S. Marines have just launched a big drive to recruit men for the Citizens Marine Corps. You young fellows might like to look into that. Now, let me thank Barry Fitzgerald and Dorothy Kirsten for being such charming guests this evening. It was most enjoyable, Bing. And when you get to New York, drop in at the Met, will oh, you? Oh, I will, Dorothy. Be sure to bring your spear. Oh, I will, yes. <laughs> Say, Bing, what? when are you going to have that fellow Al Johnson on your program again? <laughs> Well, Jolie's promised to be with us, I think, the week after next, Barry. Who's with you next week, Abby? Next week, Dorothy Frankie Lane will be on hand. We hope to cook up some very merry stuff. Good night, Dorothy. Good night, Bing. Goodbye, me boy. You mean good boy, me bye? No, I meant what I said. Yeah. No. Okay, boy, goodbye. Not goodbye, me boy. I can't win with this fella. You've got to run second. Good night, folks, and thanks. The program was produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Bill Morrow and Murdo McKenzie. Barry Fitzgerald appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of Golden Earrings, starring Ray Milland and Marlena Dietrich. Tune in to Philco Radio Time next week and hear Bing Crosby, John Scott Trotter and his orchestra, the Rhythm Airs, and Bing's guest, Frankie Lane. And remember, for tops in radio listening all the time, get a Philco, famous for quality the world over. Mm -hmm.